Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Hey, Laurel. Hi there. Nice to see you. Hi, Sarah. Hello. Hi, Lynn. Glad you're here. Lynn's a support person for me. Glad to Excellent. be here. It always takes a moment for people to gather, so. How's everybody doing this morning? Anybody have anything to report from where you are? I just want to say I have a fairly unstable connection, so I'm not going to use video for a while. Thanks for letting us know. To totally OK, of course. I'm hey John, I'm unmuted. How's the background noise? Uh, it's fine. It's OK. OK, okay. great. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll mute and unmute as needed. Good to see everyone. You know, it's a fascinating dynamic with uh, our new work environment that like VCRD, we've kind of returned back to the office this summer. And, but yet we're still doing a fair amount of virtual conversations. And so like your workspace needs are different when like you have people on Zooms and like people, like Nick and I are actually in the same general office space, but of course we had to go into different rooms because you don't really want that cross zooming or cross conversation. So anyway, it's um, you're, like our space needs have been reformulated by the trend towards more virtual conversation. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic. It's really good exercise and like focusing on one voice while multiple voices are talking around you too. Tell you what. Uh, some of us are better than others at doing that. <laughs> so welcome everybody. We'll start in a couple of minutes. People are still gathering here. Really uh, appreciate you all joining us on a beautiful sunny September morning. Holy smokes. These are the days right now where I sort of get, as soon as we hit September, I get into this mode of like, oh, just uh, gotta extract every last bit of sort of joy and fun out of the warm, gorgeous weather. It's uh, always a little hard. Well, so I guess embedded in that is some appreciation that we've, we've enticed you all to be on a screen for the next hour or hour and a half. So we thank you all for, for joining us. Even better that it's not 90 degrees and 90% humidity. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Seriously, right? This is the sweet spot right now. <laughs> Get it while it's hot. <laughs> or not so hot, as the case may be. If only there weren't so many apples to deal with. Is, and is tomatoes. And, and tomatoes. Oh, my gosh. The cherry tomatoes, we have a little shared gar garden with our neighbors and the cherry tomatoes are just gone wild. Every day, we just come home with so many of them. It's yep. really, it's awesome. Yep. I didn't go out <laughs> yesterday to pick and I'm now terrified. <laughs> yeah, you might problems have, to have them. Missed the window, Emily. You might as well just stay home for the rest of the season. <laughs> I'll get you. Sorry. Go ahead, Wendy. What were you saying? And then Brian. I was just gonna say there's a nice trend in our neighborhood that a bunch of people put out tables and cups full of their cherry tomatoes, and you can just take them as you do your dog walk and pass by. And my daughter's decided that cherry tomato is straight off the vine and the best thing ever. So she gets all messy on her dog walks. It's great. Yeah, I my... planted ground cherries for the first time. And I planted six plants. I really wanted to have some of them. And I went and pulled two of the plants out last week because I was getting overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah, if people make the mistake of saying they don't have a garden, I'm like, okay, just leave your car doors unlocked and like, just don't look. Yeah, Emily, uh, please don't go to your garden, but give us the address. <laughs> Uh, I worked uh, for a few summers growing up in Brattleboro. I worked at a little farm stand called Walker Farm. I'm sure some of you know it on, on Route 5 in Dummerston, a fabulous place. And like the zucchini, like Jack Mannix was really particular about the size of zucchini that was perfect. 
And if you missed one of those zucchini and then went back the next day, inevitably it would just be a little bit too big and you'd, you'd bring it in anyway and Jack would be like, nope. And he'd just toss it and you're like, oh gosh, the pressure of getting those zucchini just the right size. <laughs> It con all contributes to food waste. Those zucchinis are really good to eat. Grate them up and put them in your freezer. I They're good put them for in by the measuring cup too. full. So it goes onto my zucchini recipe really easy, my zucchini bread recipe. Mm. Nice. Nick, that you're right. They're excellent for home defense. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty sizable, some of those zucchini. The cucumbers are good for it too. I've managed to keep a lot of teenagers out of my house because all my kids' friends are in the house and every time they walk through the room, I'm like, you would like a cucumber and now they won't even come to my house anymore. <laughs> There's only so many sandwiches, soups, little salads, caprizis that you can make, stand as a person. Pickles you can eat all winter. That's true, good point, Brian. Yeah, my, I'm really excited that my wife has, this is the first season she's getting into pickling. And man, we just had some some green and yellow beans that she pickled and they just, they came out fabulously. And it's like a whole, a whole new horizon of what to do with our stuff. So. All right, we should get started. We really, oh gosh, look at the clock. We should get started. I, it's it's kind of nice to go down this, uh, this rabbit hole of talking about our gardens and, and produce. And in a way, it kind of connects to what we're talking about uh, today, which is, um, you know, the theme for this workshop, sort of as we titled it, sort of the future of mutual aid, and how do we think about the organizations that we built in our communities, and how to sort of carry that work forward, sort of beyond this current crisis, and looking ahead towards future crises, let's say. And, uh, and, but I, in inviting presenters, I think I expanded our scope a little bit. And I just want to explain that as we get started, which is, uh, here's how I'm thinking about this topic generally and today, which is, if, if we think back over the last 18 to 20 months, so much, uh, I guess, one observation I have is about our development of new relationships and new connections in our communities. We, we, we stepped forward in a bunch of different ways uh, to support one another. And that happened at a bunch of different scales from neighbor to neighbor. I mean, we talk about sort of putting our veg vegetables out in front of our house. Um, uh, from neighbor to neighbor to sort of to broader neighborhoods, to communities. And, and to regions, like we, we've, we've figured out some different ways to be supportive of one another. And when we think about sort of the term mutual aid, it really is about sort of being available to help uh, folks when, uh, when our neighbors need help, but also knowing that we can go to our neighbors when we need help, right? That exchange and creating sort of the venue and the organization to allow for that exchange. Because I think what we have seen in Vermont uh, over the last, um, I mean, we see this often in Vermont. This isn't something that's new with the pandemic, but what we know is that there's Vermonters who are ready to help one another. And sometimes what really makes a difference is when there is someone who's willing to facilitate that help from one Vermonter to another. And that's often what I think we, in so many different shapes and forms, that's what we've done over the last year with our mutual aid efforts. But it's also, I, as, as we think about some of the lessons of this pandemic and we look ahead, I guess, here's, here's something I'm gonna say that, I don't know, feels a little gloom and doom, but you know what? Uh, COVID-19 is not our last crisis. Uh, it's, uh, we know there's something else coming in the future in Vermont. And, and it's, we don't, we, and to some degree, maybe we do know what shape it's gonna take. We know there are climate related uh, disasters coming our way, but there's other, there's other crises that we're gonna face in our future. And so like, I think one of our, sort of our fundamental question that we're talking about today is how, how are we sort of perpetuating and building the, 
human and organizational infrastructure that positions us well and strengthens us such that when that next challenge comes along, we are, uh, we're more prepared. That, that those building blocks of human connection that we've built over the last year and a half or two years, those building blocks are, um, are in place and ready to be sort of re repositioned uh, for, for what comes next. And so for some of us, that's around mutual aid. It's really specific. We built a mutual aid organization and we're thinking about now that not that we're beyond this current crisis, but as we think ahead, we really want to think about how do we how do we reconfigure uh, or position it such that it has longevity for the future because we know we're going to need it. But some of our presenters today are also just more generally on this topic of like how are we engaging our communities around preparedness, around sort of hazard mitigation, and thinking about the future. So that's like a little bit of a broader frame for this workshop today. It's not, but to me, those are really two sides of the same coin. Like you, you, you know, that those those two things are so so married together. So uh, I think for those of you who have participated in workshops before, you'll be familiar with this basic format, which is we're going to hear some great uh, presentations from four folks who've been doing this work in their community. But honestly, as I look around the screen, I know that any of you have things you could be bringing to this conversation. And so while, while we'll spend like the first, you know, 30 to 40 minutes uh, doing that sharing um, of some specific presentations, we will then shift to much more of an open forum. Some of that might be some questions and answers for the, for the presenters. But I, my hope is that you all will have other things to contribute to this conversation and um, other examples, because that what we know in these workshops is that, that there is tremendous richness and wisdom in this, in this room, let's say, this virtual room. And so we really want to provide a venue for that. We are scheduled to go till 1130. We know that some folks have an hour of, of time or maybe patience, let's say, for this, and, and it's totally uh, okay to hop off at 11, um, but would encourage you if, if, if you're finding it, it worthwhile to stick around for deeper conversation for that, for that last um, half hour. So that's my introduction uh, as we get going. And I am going to um, introduce our first speaker, who's Emily Rosenbaum from uh, Lamoille County. And Emily, I think, you know, maybe wears a couple hats. One is with uh, the, um, the, the incident command effort, let's say in Lamoille, LASROC. And then also Emily is now the initiative director, director for the working communities challenge effort that's going on in Lamoille as well. And so Emily, I'm gonna turn it over to you to share a little bit of like, how, how LASROC is thinking, uh, thinking forward and, and some of the work you're doing. So Emily, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, super exciting to be here. And all, you know, this is the perfect moment for you to be asking those questions of Lamoille County. Um, and it's, you know, when I talk to people around the state, they're like, so exactly where's Lamoille County? Um, and we do get a little bit forgotten that way. Um, but I will say it certainly made us strong through this when the <laughs> pandemic hit. Um, it was within, you know, we, Copley Hospital and a couple of other partners immediately convened folks and very quickly there was um, support for, for standing up an incident command. And um, the incident command ended up going, really being very active for 15 months. And it was only at the beginning of this summer um, that we stood down to some degree. Um, I'm, can I share a screen? Is that going to be allowed? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to share a screen and, um, of course it won't let me go up to the top. Hold on one second. Um, but I want to go past, yeah, it puts the little bar up and then I can't switch tabs, but hold on. I got it. There we go. Okay, there is, this is our um, org chart 
for our incident command that we were able to, um, to stand up. And a lot of it probably looks fairly uh, familiar to you folks. You probably have these kinds of, of um, situations in your own areas. But what was interesting and the, the things that we were able to do that were sort of what we called the special sauce. This down here, this was the, the standard, right? The, the, the meat and potatoes of what we were doing. How do we get people housed? How do we get people medical help? What do we do about mental health and substance misuse? These TBDs are wrong. There were people in those roles. Um, but we also had a planning chief and a logistics chief, and we had people in finance and admin, and I was brought in in public information, um, as well as house of worship liaison. You'll see these liaisons over here. We had folks reaching into every area of the community. Um, and I'm not gonna get too detailed about it now, except to say that it was really highly structured. There was a lot of buy-in and we saw a lot of success um, across a lot of areas. We had an incredible flu shot season. Um, sorry, I have three coworkers behind me. Quiet. Um, and we, um, we saw a, a tremendous amount of success in the flu shots, but we also had success in things like our food folks told us we needed freezers and we didn't have enough freezers in the county and we had no way of preserving the food and the everyone eats. And it was like everybody rowing in the same direction, all sorts of work. And now we have these freezers that were several organizations involved, plus funding from the state that are scattered around the county, well, the, the health area that more or less function as little free pantries that are being maintained with food in them so that they're in people's communities. And, and, and the, you could pick any example, you know, um, if you look at the vaccination numbers in the state, it's not accidental that Lamoille's at the top of it. That was because it was a priority across 30 different organizations with our incident command. So it was a very strong collaborative, a lot of trust, everything from supporting the folks in the hotels um, to supporting mental health, uh, to, to pick something, you know, it was, it was there and um, PPE at the beginning, um, Narcan distribution, uh, everything that we possibly needed to be doing. Um, and I was very, very, very lucky that I was brought in at the time um, because I was involved in my house of worship um, and given an opportunity to help serve in this way. But as we went into the winter, dark, dark winter last winter, um, anyone who's nodding, you probably have teenagers. Um, we, we, we realized that we, we couldn't let that kind of incredible collaboration go. Um, and um, that we were providing something for the community that the community was really, really hungry for. Um, and that we were gonna need to figure out what the next steps in that were. And I'm gonna share screen again, because I wanna show you what we were doing in public information because public information, we've been able to carry over, um, but then I'm gonna explain a few other things. So our public information, which I was again, fortunate to be allowed to do, has focused around a couple of area, areas. One um, is a weekly newsletter that goes out to about 600 community leaders. It goes out to the clergy, it goes out to the schools, it goes out to the librarians. Um, the librarians are like my secret weapon. It goes out to the therapists, it goes out to, you pick somebody, they're getting it. The fire, the home health workers, the pharmacists, everybody's getting it. Um, and this newsletter goes out, it's meant to be super easily skimmable so that people can find out what's available. And then there's the sharing priority and the schools sent it out, the houses of worship sent it out, the, li libra the libraries sent it out. Um, everything is, is um, accessible in your inbox and you're supposed to be able to skim it within a few minutes. And we also put out business cards, um, about 10,000 business cards that we scattered in the community with a QR code. And the QR code um, was to bring them to this site, which um, was another sort of example of the way the collaboration jumped together really quickly. Very early on, United Way realized somebody had to take the lead on a resource page. Um, and so they jumped into it, but they were pulled into the incident command and everyone began feeding things into it. And with their limited staff, they became quickly overwhelmed. 
but they handed it over to me as public information officer. And what I do is everything that comes into that newsletter gets updated here. People are constantly checking this collaboratively across organizations to see what needs to be fixed. Our latest thing is this, um, where can I train, train for a job or a career? And the website has some limited um, back uh, functionality. It's not fabulous, um, but if you look at it, we've managed to get pretty much anything you could possibly need in Lemoyle up there. So why is that relevant as we move forward? Well, what has happened is we got some funding from a couple of different places to do work to figure out how the collaboration is going to move forward. And um, it was, you know, the nice thing is I got hired as the Working Communities Challenge Project Director at the beginning of the summer. So the employment stuff and all the public information stuff seamlessly moved over to Working Communities Challenge. Um, but we also have Lamoille Health Partners is doing a lot of collaborative work um, through the Lamoille Health Partnership, um, which has really flowed out of all the collaboration that we did. And so they're doing work there as well, and we're all working together. But there's also some work in terms of mapping the collaboratives, supporting the collaboratives, um, finding, um, we have because we have that funding, there's a consultant in our area who gives us um, a cut rate, who's been a part of all of this work, who is doing a lot of support for grant work um, for the different organizations. So we have everybody tied into it together um, to moving all of those pieces towards the next phase. And we've really stood down the incident command, but it's ready if we need it again, because we do have that clear, clear structure. And our operations team still meets every other week just to make sure everybody is still synchronized um, with the stuff that we're doing. Um, so I hope I've been clear, you know, obviously my area was public information. So that was the, the view that I had more than anything else. And it's been a little unfair around the county because everyone thinks I'm doing everything because my name is on it. Um, you know, it's my column in the paper. I'm the one who's sending out the newsletter, but it's really been, that's just because I've been the public face. Um, it, you know, it was everything from vaccination clinics in the hotels to, um, to making sure, I mean, literally the pharmacists will text me to tell me they're, you know, back when you were trying to get kids in for shots, you know, there are shots available today, that kind of a thing. So um, it was really everybody pulling in the same direction. And the goal is to keep that going as we move forward by moving the different collaborative parts forward um, and by inviting our partners to continue to do that. And we're seeing it now with recovery friendly workplaces. There's a lot of buy-in. Our businesses are really desperate for employees. And so they're buying in with a lot of the working communities challenge work. I hope I was fast enough. Uh, that's great. And honestly, that's, uh, uh, it's powerful. Like when I, um, just to share a quick reflection, like that website, that newsletter, um, in, in part, you, you build something around COVID response that has utility in an ongoing way. So you're figuring out how to do it. And, and then an ancillary benefit is the collaboration on the newsletter and the website actually helps you retain your collaboration and your human infrastructure such that when you need that again, it's right there and ready to go. So like, yes, it's important to have the webpage for its own purpose, but some of the back end work is also really helpful because you're retaining some connection and collaboration. Is that, am I sort of getting that right? That is absolutely 100% correct. Um, and it's been really phenomenal. And um, I just got a direct message that somebody's not on my newsletter. So thank you. I will add you. Um, but it's been exactly that. And I think that the, new, the communications collaboration is an example to our community how you can build infrastructure that doesn't mess with anybody's particular work, but de-silos some of the things everyone shouldn't have to do their own communication out to the same people. And so it's an example of how you can build that kind of infrastructure. That's great. Thanks so much, Emily. Really, um, really appreciate that. So our next, uh, our next presenter is from the other end of the state, practically Rockingham, uh, Laurel Green. And Laurel, um, Laurel's active with uh, Rockingham Help and Helpers. I think I'm getting that name right, but also the chair of Sustainable Rockingham. 
and has been busy this summer in some hosting some public conversations about sort of resilience in the future of Rocky Camp. So right. Carl, that's all good yours. morning. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Glad to be here with you. Uh, it's great to have a leaders a meeting with other people that are leading. <laughs> How exciting. Mm -hmm. So um, Sustainable Rockingham actually came out of a VCRD community visit series. It was one of the three prioritized um, task force groups. It was originally named the task force on the to advance community energy efficiency and resilience. And that was too much of a mouthful. So um, we voted and decided to switch it to um, Sustainable Rockingham, although I would have loved to have the word resilience in it. Um, I volunteered to chair it because of my concern about the effects of climate change on our town and wanting to build resiliency here. Um, so we started, you know, in February of um, 2020. So pretty quickly, COVID was here. And so we helped launch Rockingham Help and Helpers. And a number of people remained involved in that. Um, it sort of took on a life of its own, which is really great. And so I'm not gonna be reporting much about that today. Um, this year, fairly early in the year, some of us went to talk with the town manager and he said, you know, what we really could use is a campaign on blue sky days. And I was like, what's that? Turns out it's a Red Cross term for beautiful days like today when we can just sort of go about business as usual, but it's also a great time to prepare for emergencies. And as opposed to a gray sky day, which is when you're responding or recovering from some kind of terrible disaster. So we decided to focus on uh, a 10 day period with blue sky days, um, primarily on family and um, individual preparedness. Um, had nine, People volunteer to make grab and go kits and nine downtown businesses that let us use their storefronts for 10 days to put up lots of information about emergency preparedness and for people to get to look at what every kit is really different. So that was really fun and exciting. We did some other activities at the end. We had a grand finale where we got to talk about the highlights of Blue Sky Days and also what our next step was, and that was the hazard mitigation study group series. We also ate ice cream because, you know, life is sweet and we have a local scoop shop that would volunteer to donate ice cream. So, hey, you know, got to ask, got a yes, you know, that was good. Um, our blue sky days were very timely. Um, during that time, you know, in July, we had heat wave, we had tropical nights where the temperature didn't go below 68 degrees, sleepless nights. Uh, we also had in the town of Rockingham, a total of about 16 inches of rain. The last of it came on July 29th with a very severe some thunderstorm here at my house. We had five and a half inches of rain in about six hours, it resulted in flash flooding, how a lot of swamped basements. Um, one of the worst things was we've had landslides that we'd never seen before because the what ground was so inundated with water. And then that deluge just brought um, a number of hillsides down. So I actually got at request to keep the grab and go kits up like this storm got people's attention here, um, which was good, but we didn't do that. We were going on to hazard mitigation. So I prepared a study guide for this um, study series. We had an introductory talk, a progress report at the end, and in between we had 14 meetings, hour and a half long Zoom meetings, or in person, they were hybrid, um, to talk about the 14 effects of climate change that are happening here in Vermont. They're listed in the Vermont Hazard Mitigation Plan that was approved in 2018. And our town has not been including that at all, um, only looking backwards to make the new hazard mitigation plan. Our hazard, old hazard mitigation plan was um, approved in 2015. It expired in 2020, yeah, along with COVID. And so it just kind of fell by the wayside. And I started asking around and found out um, that 
if we had a disaster, we would be losing out on about 5% of the funding available. That's sort of the carrot part of um, hazard mitigation planning. Um, so this is really fresh news. We just finished the um, study groups last week. Our report back was on Monday night. And just kind of by the numbers, the short version is we had these um, 16 meetings. We had 14 residents show up and contribute to them for a total of about 24 hours of work together. We came up with 31 action steps and a third of those have climate change specifically written into them, which felt a little daring. And I'm really glad we did it that way. So these are basically the ideas to prevent or reduce the effects of climate change and natural disasters on the people, the natural environment and the built environment in our town of Rockingham. And we are so pleased with the work we've done. It's really, you're talking about the connections and um, that, um, that has been one of the biggest rewards, um, getting to have real sit down talks with the uh, emergency management director uh, who's also the fire chief, the police chief, um, people in the water treatment system. Um, you know, just we really got to have some good conversations. So the town planner was really important in, this, in the process. So we um, have been working with the regional planner, senior a uh, senior planner, who. <clears throat> does the write-ups for, you know, she knows how to jump the hoops for the, these FEMA local hazard mitigation plans. And I had let her know about the Blue Sky Days and the plan for the hazard mitigation study groups. And so um, continue working with her. She met with us yesterday and led key town officials and people from Sustainable Rockingham and our one of our local legislative representatives uh, through the assessment process and the beginning of prioritization. Um, basically, we're having to go through each of the steps, the action steps that we proposed and to tighten up the language and see what resources the town has available. And again, I'm just, I couldn't have been more delighted with the process that we had yesterday. Um, there were, you know, no doubt that um, climate change is a big effect here. There's no pushback from the, from the town officials at all. Um, and they can add resources that we didn't know about. So um, that, you know, there's, there's lots of examples of that. Um, let's see. So John, how am I doing? Do I have a couple more minutes? Yeah, a couple more minutes. I in in part, I'd love to hear like how do you think about carrying this work forward? Maybe that's part of what you want to get at. Is sort okay. Of it, yeah. Yep. Um. Yeah. So. Okay. I just I I want to kind of finish up about the hazard mitigation work. So we're in the middle of this process, writing the goals and, um, the planner. Um, you know, usually it takes a year to write a hazard mitigation plan. So we were we were trying to front end it by having these meetings. We figured there'd be hearings in maybe October and the writing would start in the winter. But because of the event on, on July 29th, uh, the governor has asked for a, a disaster declaration. It hasn't been um, approved yet. If it does, within if we can get a completed plan, submitted to the state within 30 days, we could access that extra 5% funding. So this um, regional planner, who's a, a mom of an infant and a preschooler, has taken on writing our plan before the end of October. She's really jumped it up. And so that relationship that I started building over the last year is going to pay money for our town. If we have a million dollars of damage from the disaster, that could mean 50,000 bucks in our town, which is big. I'm in a town of 5,000 people. That's a, that's a chunk of change for us. Um, so that's really made a difference. Um, written into the plan is um, 
and hopefully access to support is funding, well, funding and support for sustainable Rockingham to do more work specifically on building neighborhood networks so that we have more mutual aid on a, a little bit more formalized letter level and also um, Rockingham Help and Helpers, um, which really came up around COVID. And it's been kind of not laid down, but it's definitely on the back burner at this point, but getting some um, organizational help to see how we can um, bring that forward into the future are two of the things that are actually written into our hazard mitigation plan at this point. Um, and you know, there's there's more. We've only gone through maybe a third of the action steps, so there's going to be more of that collaboration happening. One of the big things we want to see is just more communication from the town. So you know, I was definitely listening to Emily about the information, uh, having an information officer. We need that here, and maybe we can get that built into the plan as well. Um, so. Um, I just kind of want to leave with two things. One is a quote that I've adapted from Pamela Haynes. She uh, took a course that she led on understanding economics this spring, and she ended every class with this, and I've changed it, adapted it just a little bit here. Um, ordinary people must be the agents of change. We can think about these issues. We can imagine solutions. We can speak out and act for a livable future for us all. And together we have everything that it takes. And the other thing is I encourage you to take action in your community to reverse global warming, to reverse climate change at the local level or from the local level. I'm willing to share my thinking. I love to listen to people as they think through how to make this work for them. And the documents that we developed, the, the study sheet, um, I would you know, be glad to share that. So, and I am gonna stay for the breakout room. So if people wanna have more conversations about hazard mitigation, I'm happy to talk about that. And I'll put my email in the chat. Thanks, Laurel. Uh, I really appreciate that. You know, I, I and just to, and this responds a little bit to what uh, I think Ruby put in the chat. Like, I think one of the things that I keyed off of that, you know, sometimes I think people think of a hazard mitigation plan as sort of this piece of paper that just sits somewhere, a sort of bureaucratic exercise. But like a couple of things that strike me, one is sort of the, the way you're sort of building a team to do this work not simply leaving it to sort of town officials, but making it more of a collaborative effort with Sustainable Rockingham. And then sort of writing right into that plan, building some of those things around Rockingham Help and Helpers and the neighborhood organizations that you know, you know you're gonna need to move forward. So I just feel uh, really timely and, and important. So thanks, Laurel. Uh, our next uh, presenter is uh, Jill Davies from Woodstock, who's gonna talk about some of their um, their work, particularly, this is, I, I would say a little more on the, on the financial side of like, they, they um, built and sustained a structure to really support members of the community who needed some financial help over the course of this pandemic and have thought a lot about how, um, what to do with that structure as we, as we move beyond the pandemic. So Jill, it's all you. Hey, hello. Uh, I wanted to, I'm not going to stay, be able to stay for the breakout groups, but Teo is, has just joined us and she's part of the group going forward as well. So you'll have her to ask questions too. So I'm going to take you back to the start of the pandemic and I'm going to tell you what we did here in this area. And then I'm going to tell you how we're building on the lessons we've learned. So um, I am the president of the Woodstock Community Trust in uh, Woodstock. And I've been part of many different boards over the over time. And Teo is the uh, executive director of the Otakuchi Health Foundation. When we um, when this pandemic happened 15 months ago, a group of us got together and we established this Woodstock Area Relief Fund. So, and we did it for our school district. So that was Woodstock, Barnard, Bridgewater, Killington, Pomfret, Ply Plymouth, and Reading. 
we got ourselves organized. I think our first meeting was on the 1st of April. It, two weeks later, we um, opened our doors or phones or emails. We had 100,000 in the bank from nothing and the whole organization being created from nothing. And we raised and gave out over $820,000 in that time. And our aim was to help people who were just unable to meet their basic living needs due to all of that economic disruption that was caused. So that was people of all incomes. And we wanted to help people maintain and then regain and establish their level of financial security. Because as things got, went on longer and longer, it got more and more important to take that longer term view. So we learned a lot of lessons as we went. Um, the first is that we can work really quickly when we're all concentrated on the same thing. Um, there were 46 volunteers involved in this effort. We started with 20 and we built as, as we needed more people. Um, in just those two weeks, by working together in that aligned fashion, we raised $100,000. We created application forms and an intake system. We set up the fiscal relationship with the Woodstock Community Trust. So it was handy that I was involved in both. We got a bank account, we got a checkbook, and then we created the website, the Facebook page, the flyers and the list of posts. And we did all of that so that we could um, get started. We didn't feel comfortable without that money in the bank. Um, and I think Emily mentioned this. This was a time of huge commitment by people. Every single volunteer took on tasks. Sometimes the task was emptying the post office box and walking it up to my house. But what ev every single task was important. And the key thing was that everybody completed them as promised. Like this was everybody's major focus. Everybody did what they said they would do without any questions. And that was really important in this whole time period. Um, what we achieved was that we became a resource for 264 families and individuals who lost their income. So we helped them when we thought it was a short term thing. We basically were writing checks for $1,000. We didn't ask many questions. People ran out of money really quickly. And people think of Woodstock as a rich area. It's yes, there's some very wealthy people here, but there's some people who have no more than a couple of weeks money in, in the bank. And when they lost their jobs, they couldn't pay their rent, they couldn't pay their heating. And so we had to just keep the money going. We were paying bills for people. Um, and then when it started going on longer, we people couldn't return to work or they were re returning to work with reduced hours and income. And then there were all those people who had to stay home because their children were staying home. So we kept helping people. And then, pe then we had the extra childcare expenses as the schools didn't open. So we helped families with those expenses too. So when you add it all together, we helped 700 individuals. We made grants of $820,000 to people in all of those areas. We were paying rent and mortgages, utility bills, car payments and repair bills childcare and grocery bills. One of the things we achieved probably more than anything is we were the stress reduction people of the area because we had money. So there were all these state programs out there, they just took so long. And so many people have unsecure un, un relationships with their landlords that they couldn't afford to be six weeks late with their rent. So we paid. Um, I think one of the lessons that we learned out of all of this is that you have to have really strong teams. So Emily's organization chart is a little bit how we were working. Um, we had different teams to do different jobs. And yet, and then the leader of each team came together. And in the beginning, we were meeting three times a week, then twice a week, then as it got a bit quieter, we were once a week. But we kept meeting so that all these 46 people worked very closely together. So we had an intake team who built the systems, checked the emails and the post office box every day to make sure that no applicant was lost and they all got the help they needed. And then they wrote the checks. We had a finance team. They had to get, we had to get set up to take credit cards, checks. We had gifts of stock and we had cash. And then we had to keep everything organized. So we had a, a professional bookkeeper for that. We had a fundraising team who made phone calls, sent emails and letters 
so that we got 636 donations from 442 donors. And those donations were $20 to many thousands of dollars. And each one came with great meaning. Um, we had an outreach team who met every week uh, and they met every week for 15 months. So this is not like a two week effort. We were all at it for 15 months. Um, the outreach team met every week. They worked on press releases, Lister, Facebook posts, and they were reaching out into every community every week to make sure everyone knew that um, our organization was here and happy to help them. And that's a lesson in itself. And then we had a couple of people devoted to operations. And this was really important. So we were working so fast that we needed somebody to keep a, a one big picture of the whole thing and make sure that we were all aligned. You know, the left hand knew what the right hand was doing. And then as we kept me, uh, moving, we really needed to keep a close eye on what money was coming in and what was going out because we kept having to make different decisions. You know, we thought we were there for maybe a month in the beginning, and then it stretched. And then we thought, oh, we have tons of money. And then it stretched, and the timeline stretched and stretched, and we thought, we have no money. So we had to go out and raise more money. And then in January, we had another influx of people, and this was a different one. This is people who'd been trying to survive on their savings and had run up credit card debt, and then with no, um, no light at the end of the tunnel, they said, okay, I give up, I need help. And so we had a different kind of help. So we went and raised more money. So we had to keep adapting and having the right information to make the decisions made, meant we would meet for an hour and we'd make decisions in the hour. And we were, we were fast decision makers whenever we could be because we had to keep moving. So now we've closed the fund. We came to the end of June and we closed the fund. We made sure that everybody we've been working with was okay. Um, and we're hoping we don't have to open the doors again um, to, but we do have a little bit of money left in case we do. So what we've done is to take everything we've learned about setting up an organization like this and put it in a manual so that anybody can copy that as, as a model, not the model, but as a model so that everybody knows how to do it if they need to. Um, because we also believe there's going to be other widespread crises. This is our second. I've, I've only lived here 12 years, and this is the second I've been involved in. And then the other thing that we're doing is we're working with a group of um, stakeholders who do this work every day, not just in an emergency. There's several different organizations that help their neighbors financially and um, in, in bigger ways than that. And what we've learned is that we can build a stronger collaborative. That was a word that um, Emily used as well. We can build a much stronger collaborative network of all the providers and the funders because we won't really want to make it easy for the applicants. Applicants are facing a crisis and they really don't need to fill out five separate forms. And yet we have five separate organizations that give finance. And so imagine yourself, out of the pandemic, but maybe your house has just burnt down. That's a personal crisis. Maybe your husband has, worked, has just walked out and you're a mom with three kids. You have a crisis going on and the last thing you have time for is to fill out a form. So we wanted to make a system that's easy for applicants. We want to connect people with money and other support and we want to tie them into all of the public state services that are there. But, and we want to, so we want to hold their hand through this whole thing. Um, the other thing we learned is we need to do lots of outreach. You need to be in posts every week, twice a week, because otherwise people don't know that you're there. So many organizations do a little marketing and they help people all the time, but there's a whole load of people that they don't help because those people don't know about them. So we need Emily to come and do public information for us. Um, and then the other thing we learned is that the leaders need to meet frequently and be totally nimble in adjusting their priorities and processes um, so that you can, uh, they can adapt and find answers to hurdles and exceptions, because there's always exceptions. So we're calling this idea the hub, and you've seen it, I'm sure you've seen it before, NEK has it, but we're going to make it work here in our area. So I'll share my screen and you can see what we're talking about.
Okay, do you see a pretty picture? So this is the hub in the middle. And these are all of the different organizations who are um, offering support with the food security. Think of every nodule as a different organization. Those are all the food shelves. Um, the financial support are the different organizations who have money to support things, housing, childcare. Child, we put childcare and senior care together because we realize that through all of this, they're really very similar. Um, and then you've got this add-on thing that can be the emergency need, which hopefully isn't needed too often, but it's there. And this hub, this virtual organization, probably a phone call, emails, likely to be, it's going to be a person as well, um, can be responsible for making this hub work. And the way we want to make it work is um, by relying on caseworkers. So through this, um, through the pandemic, we, everybody who came and asked for help was given a caseworker and they just interacted with that caseworker rather than lots and lots of different people. They never saw behind the scenes. So there was always that one person to hold their hands and they built a really good relationship as they came back many times. And we want the same kind of thing to happen with the hub. So somebody comes in, maybe they come to a food shelf, they get taken to the hub or connected with the hub, they, they fill out that application form. And then the hub, the person at the hub builds a resource team. So they build the team. It's coming from all the different places where this person needs help. This team might be invisible to the individual that needs the help and it's the caseworker that helps that person get to all of those resources. Or because we've done such great marketing, a person might come directly to the hub and then we connect them to all the people that they want, again, through the caseworker. So we're at the stage of having ideas, being wanting to go back to our stakeholders and see if there's any more ideas. Um, we want to, and then we'll be building this organization and we'd love it to be in operation by January. We have a couple of uh, funders um, because, who are really interested in resilience. So this kind of supporting the community is seen as resilience work as much as climate resilience work, because more people are gonna be hit by these kind of emergencies. So this is the financial way to help a community be more sustainable. And that's where we are right now. We have a meeting next week to get to talk to the, the stakeholders and then we'll keep building these ideas forward until we've got something that's operational. Okay. Thank you, Jill. Man, oh man. You know, I'm, I'm sensitive to a little bit of what I, um, uh, I'm responding again to some of what I see in chat, which is like the scale of that work that you've done, Jill, in Woodstock, to some degree, I imagine some of you are on here and that feels like in a different, almost in a different universe, maybe, especially when you're talking about like big sums of money. But at the same time, I guess here's, here's the flip side to that is that that organizational chart you just showed, showed I think that's, uh, it feels like that's the challenge we all are, are and have been facing over the course of this last uh, year and a half is really not only mapping those different resources, but figuring out how we're connecting our neighbors with those resources uh, in, a, in a simple way as possible, right? Whether it's the outreach, whether it's having that one point of contact, like that feels so important about this. Um, uh, uh, and as we think ahead, how do, how do we sort of um, uh, sustain that and, um, and really it's almost a reconfiguration of everything that we do in the, in the, in the world of providing services to one, right? So, um, I'm going to quickly get to Margaret cause we're, um, here, we're always, uh, watching the clock a little bit. So our final presenter, and I see a hand from, from Penelope. My hope is that folks can Hi. stick around. Um, but um, I'm, 
So I love it that Emily at, at the beginning talked about our librarians as secret weapons. And I think that's <laughs> a perspective that uh, we share at BCRD. <laughs> our librarians are in fact sometimes secret, often not secret. They just have uh, tremendous power in our communities. And Margaret is the librarian in Charlotte and has been busy as part of a team engaging the community around sort of resilience and preparedness in Charlotte. So Margaret, it's, uh, it's all you. Thank you. Um, I, I, it's so great just to start off to hear about what everybody else is doing and um, to, to find the connections. So I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, I'm never very good at this, so we'll see what happens. Can everybody see that? Yes? Okay, awesome. So um, uh, I'm the library is part of the Charlotte Community um, Partnership. And uh, one task that we took on was the creation, dissemination, and then sort of uh, uh, collation of, the, of a community resilient survey. Um, the Charlotte Community Partnership, like so many that we've heard about today, was a response to the pandemic. It was by um, a couple of us here at the library, the Charlotte Food Shelf, and the Congregational Church. We've met twice a month since April 2020. And I think one of the most amazing things for me in this town was to um, draw, find out that so many people wanted to be part of uh, this group and part of meeting need with opportunity and you know available resources. Um, and I think one role the library was able to play was that we are a place people come to for information. And Emily, as you mentioned, you know, sharing that information out with libraries is um, is one thing we love to do. So um, this is our, our little logo, and um, these are some of the folks that um, participated. We also had the Charlotte Energy Committee join in. We had a, a public health um, official, retired former. Uh, public health official from Massachusetts and um, our local state rep. And um, so it was a really rich and um, helpful combination of people. And, you know, what is community resilience? I don't think I need to explain that to anybody uh, sitting here today, but um, for us, uh, you know, this is sort of the three pieces of that three-legged stool we all hear so much about environmental responsibility, social equity, and economic feasibility, which I think in a state like Vermont can mean different things to different communities, and yet I feel like it's the underpinning of everything. So there's commonality, but how, what might rise to the top as a priority, or um, how you might meet those needs will be different depending on the town, but it's so important to share, share the information. And so why the library? Well, um, the New York Library Association has a very robust uh, sustainable libraries initiative program. And, and uh, if you're a library in New York, you can join in and, and sort of meet steps along the way and then you are granted sort of sustainable library status um, something i'm hoping we could uh, mirror in a smaller scale here in vermont but that was a lot of inspiration for me to even think about uh, pursuing sort of a resilience sustainability survey for our town um, i think the other thing that we all would agree on is that libraries have connections. We've made so many partnerships in our town and beyond our town. Um, and libraries are reliable. We, we offer information. We are there. We're open. Our doors are open, either literally or remotely, depending on the time, sadly. Um, so that's why libraries. And uh, so our group, uh, well, side by side with sort of meeting immediate COVID needs in our town, um, decided to undertake this community resilience work. Um, 
So what comprised community resilience and how do we in our town perceive that resilience? So it wasn't how resilient are we, but more how do people in our town look at that idea? Um, so we were, as I said, uh, assessing perceptions. Um, we were fortunate enough to work with the Community Resilience Organizations Group, and they have done similar surveys, but this was the first survey that was done over a long period of time. It was paper and online, and it was the first survey to include specific um, sort of social justice issues and also uh, COVID-related uh, questions as well. Uh, so um, if you don't know about community resilience organizations, I invite you to take a look. They are a great, a great place for some of this or uh, information and an inspiration for sure. Um, so we prepared our assessment, revised the assessments that they, the community resilience organizations had available. Um, as I said, we factored in COVID and it was a very much a Charlotte based survey. So here are the topics that we covered. COVID, as I mentioned, we had basic needs and services, um, the environment, physical infrastructure, and uh, community. Sort of all equally weighted. Um, and as uh, people have mentioned, you know, getting the word out is the most important thing. We relied on our personal contacts, stakeholders in the town, select board, uh, heads of the you know various commissions and whatnot, but also wanted to make sure we reached out to people that might not know about us and might not know this survey, but have need of some of the services. So uh, our food shelf organized a huge drive to get people to take the survey when they came to pick up food. And in fact, some of those people can't read, so they read the survey to them. So that was you know sort of even being aware of that was. Uh, um, impactful for, for us, I think. Uh, and so lastly, uh, how we're using this news, we just concluded a series of community conversations that have led to the preparation of a townwide report that we are sending out to everybody. And we are hoping that will be the next step. And I'm hoping to talk to you, Laurel, about some of what you've done um, to help uh, build resilience in all the ways that it needs to happen so that we can be a more sustainable community. So that's that's what we've done in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you, Margaret. You know, just um, just to, to close and maybe provide a little reflection that just that little, um, I guess, anecdote you just shared about the food shelf, the collaboration with the food shelf and, and the fact that sort of they uh, we're reading surveys to some of their um, uh, their uh, customers or visitors, and and like just that that feedback loop and that that you now carry that forward. Like so so sometimes it's both the results of the survey that's useful, but it's just the process of engaging other community organizations uh, that helps to build resilience. And it feels like. Um, you're sort of working on both of those fronts. You know, at this point, I really want to um, just open it up. We're at 11 o'clock, so we've gone right through, and I suspect there's some pent up, and I know some of you have different experiences, but bef actually, before I do that, let me just give a huge thanks to our presenters. Uh, yeah, a round of applause for, um, for all of our uh, presenters, um, Emily and Laurel and Margaret and Jill, you know, you clearly put some time into actually preparing and um, and you're doing incredible work uh, in, in the local level, at the local level. So really huge appreciation to you all for, um, for presenting today. And at this point, let me just open it up. I see Penelope's got a hand up. And so I wanna um, just call on her. You can use the hand raise function. I think we'll stay as a whole group, at least uh, for the beginning. We might go into breakouts if it feels like it, um, if it needs to. But I think let's keep in a com common conversation because I suspect um, we've we've got um, things to learn from one another. So Penelope, why don't you um, you go ahead and let's see what else. Um, what else Hi, I was just I was just going to comment, John, when you were talking about, for instance, Jill's. Um, chart that she put up and and with the visioning on you know by the uh, on the side there and then of course Emily brought up the 
what we call the gray box chart, et cetera. And I, I was just going to point out uh, to jump off of what you were saying. It's just so great when people can take the time and do take the time to map that out because it does then provide that springboard. And, and what we saw here, the what Emily was using is actually the um, FEMA uh, incident command boxes. It's called the INS training and anybody can adapt that. And that's one of the things that the hazard mitigation planning does. And, and so the great thing is, if people think of it, they think, oh, that's FEMA, that's National Guard, that's, you know, all of this. But what it really is, is a way to help people step out of the usual roles and um, and titles and say, who can do what best and who do we need in what box and let's move forward. And what I really loved is how Jill's group added that visioning onto it um, because that's then your springboard for forward motion, you know, mm -hmm. is that you've got that momentum going and a statement of visioning. And it just seems in all the things that I've seen, um, that any any variation on those themes really helps put some glue into it and and a platform for moving forward. So I I love those. They were really great. Look forward to receiving them. Awesome. Thanks, Penelope. Great points. Emily. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that the importance of um, not assuming that you know who can do what from the start. Um, one of the things that COVID did for our community is it, it forced us to bring in partners who maybe hadn't been um, involved. And I'll just, I'll, I'll speak personally about how it happened for me, but it happened over and over is that, you know, I was the president of the synagogue and the rabbi got the email and he said, do you want to go to this meeting? Because I know that you're worried about all the kids who are, you know, stuck in their homes and I went to the meeting and I have these these communication skills but there was no like I wasn't on anybody's radar and there's like eight other people who ended up there who weren't on anyone's radar and because they included houses of worship or maybe he, they didn't even include houses of worship I think they just included the rabbi because he was on the the shelter board um it ended up and then I pulled in some other people that people didn't know about and when you have a chart like that and you have really, 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 really clear roles and you just need the best person for that job, it's not always people who are already in the silos you know about. And I, the de-siloing that happened was really quite extraordinary. That's like a, a case statement for this thing called the Vermont Community Leadership Network that we formed is that narrative of like leadership lies everywhere in a community and you don't know where it lies. And often it's those people who aren't elected or have some official title. And like that's, it's like, how do we, and it's fascinating to me that something so formal as like a FEMA, like incident command structure document is actually a tool for helping you find some of that. Like I wouldn't have naturally thought that, that something bureaucratic like a document like that would actually be a helpful tool like you and Penelope just described. That's a little bit of a rethinking of, of some of these things, at least for me, I would say. Others, um, other thoughts or experiences to share you know, Trish, to draw you in, I know you've done some work and are thinking about this forward in your communities. I wonder, Trish Sears, if you have some thoughts about how you're carrying your work forward. Um, I, I just wanna say, and, and you know, and I said in the chat how much I appreciate, you know, all the different communities work that you shared today, but I really appreciate that the forward looking because, um, COVID is not over. Um, the ripple effects are, you know, some we're familiar with, others, you know, are showing up differently. Um, and so it's, you know, having generous authority is really helpful in clarity, you know, as in roles, as you know, some of them um, people have presented. And, you know, it, it, it gives, you know, it's a, it's a safe place in time, you know, for that work, you know, then people go back into quote real life, 
but they know that there's when there's clarity in that again generous structure that you know they can access more information and share um, and access um, more equitably you know resources um, what we i'm planning on stealing like so many ideas <laughs> that came up today and so i'll have a lot of questions you know ours may is still because we're four towns, but I noticed Rockingham also includes the area and I think the others as well, certainly Lamoille County, um, is, you know, our one of our biggest challenges are the select boards in all four towns. So they're just like, you know, and yay, that's very nice that you all are, you know, communicating and sharing this, but sounds like work. You know, and I don't know if that's something, you know, we want to get involved in. So, you know, that's where our work happened, you know, our one of our biggest challenges, you know, for the, you know, near future. And so I think, you know, learning and absorbing, you know, your lessons learned and what, you know, you put together so thoughtfully is going to really, really help you know, energize us and give us clarity and um, motivation to do the needful. So thank you very much. Yeah, you're raising a good point. And, and it's our municipalities, right? They are some, sometimes it's a select board who maybe doesn't lean in or feel some natural alignment with some of this, this work. They don't see it as part of their purview. But then there's also other institutions, I guess one thing that I'm fascinated by and think, and, and we've thought about throughout this, this last uh, year and a half is how does the more informal organic local effort integrate with the institutional or the state agency players, right? Like how do we, and, and honestly, I think what, um, what Jill put up and to some degree the work that Emily you're doing like is, is about sort of bringing unity to those very uh, diverse uh, partners, let's say. How do you sort of bring that sense of common purpose? And it requires some flexing on both ends, it feels like, where the institutional players have to adapt to some of the more informal partners and the informal partners also probably, I don't know, like I, maybe I'm throwing that out as a question or a, a point of curiosity. And that's another, thank you, John. That's another challenge that, you know, I'd like to probably not today, but learn more about as far as the sustained commitment of the agencies, the, you know, like the community action, you know, so now, you know, I'm also involved in, um, grocery delivery to families in our supervisory union who, um, you know, children are affected because they don't have enough food because the families don't have transportation. So, you know, the, you know, the different agencies that have been, it's just been such a wonderful collaboration, but now there's, you know, I'm starting to sense fatigue. And, you know, oh, but we're doing our budget and this is where the money is. So we're going to go chase the money and do this. And it's kind of like, no, this, this issue <laughs> is real and it's not going anywhere. So we still need to have that kind of commitment. So, um, you know, I, I, I applaud what you've done, you all have done. And I'd be interested if you're seeing that as well, the fatigue. Tayo, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. No, that's okay. It's Tayo, and so yeah. yeah. So I've been directly involved in um, so the post wharf um, group work with Jill. So the hub, the aspects that she um, put up. I'm on the leadership team for for that particular piece, and you know what we've seen to address kind of a lot of the comments that have happened. Uh, you know, there, there is a lot of fatigue and a lot of the organizations that we've brought in as a stakeholder group inside of that are strictly volunteer driven too. So there are not a lot of paid positions that can incorporate this into, you know, that the organization in that way. Um, so I think the hub uh, and through the process of exploring what this means, you know, we've definitely come to the conclusion that this is a person, this is a hired position 
that would be able to act as that resource hub to connect everybody because not all of those organizations have a person in place that uh, has the time to do all of that. So that was a really important component to that, to be able to uh, take some of the stress off of those individuals that may be volunteering for the food shelf, uh, that that's the capacity they have. Um, and, and so this person can, can act a little bit further into that case working that we're talking about. Um, so, so that was a really important component that the entire stakeholder group was like, yes, this has to be a person. We can't, to some extent, yes, we are all exhausted. We're all fatigued through, especially COVID, but the daily uh, need that is still seen in our communities is ongoing. And that is that adds to the general feeling of fatigue too. So my organization, the Otakuchi Health Foundation, where we partnered with, with WARF to just help with health and wellness uh, expenses that people were experiencing. We do that on a daily basis and we, and we kind of up the ante during COVID as well. Uh, and, and we're just one small piece of this hub, but we have hired, you know, I have, I have one other staff member. We have people on the ground. So our involvement in that hub uh, scenario that had been produced is it's much higher than the Reading Food Shelf, who really strictly relies on volunteers. So there's a balancing act that uh, really plays a huge role in how that particular model is going to be brought forward and actually be successful. And that's what we're still trying to figure out and why we're bringing that stakeholder group back together again in another week and a half to discuss, you know, what's the real scenarios look like for this? How are we most useful if we have this hired position? What does that look like? And the larger long-term goal would be to say, okay, so now we've, we have this, we put this in place, we, we do it for a while. How does this apply to other people's communities too? So we were trying to look at it so that it could play as a model uh, as well. I mean, there's lots of models to play off and any key prosper collective impact, but um, if we can actually have a, a more simplistic working model, hopefully that can help in a lot of the scenarios and towns that um, have had something similar to WARF too. We need that long-term kind of strategic streamlining uh, in, in, in a way and, and we're hopefully working towards that. So I just wanted to, to share that perspective just from being working through that model and having a lot of people in, involved and in, um, trying to identify the right silos in that case. So. And a question about the hub, like is it its own entity or where does it live? Is it within another organization? Does that person who staffs the hub, are they an employee of another, or is that part of what you're working through? We're working through some of those details still currently. So the Woodstock Community Trust, which housed WARF, um, uh, takes on projects. So this would be a project of that organization, which is a nonprofit. So uh, initially, that would be its home and that they would do, they would pay this person. It would be, they, that person would be employed by that organization. Though we're looking at the model of, you know, maybe I may be that person's supervisor though, because we have an empty office space. They may be on site in my building space. So there's a, there, there's kind of a, a hybrid model of, of this position. It's not going to be uh, its own entity, especially not at first. And I don't think we are looking to create something new necessarily. We want this to be integrated within all the organizations that already exist in some ways. So uh, housing it where Wharf was made a lot of sense from a financial perspective. They're really good users. They um, you know, were very organized. The Woodstock Community Trust, um, this is what they do. They help uh, get projects off the ground and, and house them for as long as necessary. So uh, that's the structure that we're heading towards. We, you know, we, we still have a lot to work on, but. That's great. I think many of us will watch that with curiosity to see uh, there's lot to, lots to be learned. Others, who else uh, has something to contribute or, or a question to frame to the group? Yeah, Laura. One of the things that I've been thinking about is, you know, we have the formal structure of our, you know, the town select board and the trustees and the school boards. Um, and 
we have the town officials, you know, the people who work for the town, the planner and the development director, the town manager. Um, and then there's like this little place where Sustainable Rockingham is playing. We're not an official town entity at all. Like I had to ask permission to use the town conference room and Zoom system to do these meetings. And the town planner said, well, this is really appropriate use for the town, but it's really sort of stretching what the requirements are for use of the building. So, you know, there's like this little place that we play as a vol all volunteer organization that in some ways is disempowered and some ways really empowered. I show up at the beginning of select board meeting really often. There's a little three minute public comment period and I'll just give news about the climate, you know, cause I want our town to talk about this. They listen, they don't say anything, but I've been, like hammering it, it's this daddy steady drumbeat in town that climate's here affecting our town. And I think that's actually a really uh, useful role that can be played by um, people that are in that interstitiary place, you know, not part of the formal structure. So I just wonder if anybody else is playing with that kind of balance. Ruby. Hi, uh, my name is Ruby McAdoo. I'm uh, with Putney Mutual Aid, and um, and I guess I, I what I was going to I raised my hand not to reply exactly to what you're saying, but it kind of dovetails because um, I think what we as Putney Mutual Aid are have been grappling with is that at the height of the pandemic and when we started and when Putney Mutual Aid was formed last March. We had a huge um, outpour of support and people who had the time and space and wanted to volunteer and help. And we also had people who need, had needs. And um, as I think many of us who were kind of boots on the ground volunteer management saw, um, as, the, as it wore on, um, in addition to the number of people volunteering or able to volunteer, that dwindled because people were going back to work. And also we we're just seeing less requests for, for help. And, um, and that's really solely from the volunteer neighbor to neighbor support process. And so one of the things we're thinking of now, and I actually am the coordinator for Putney Community Cares as well as a volunteer with Putney Mutual Aid. I think that we are um, trying to find a way to kind of hand off our volunteer management, the, that portion of Putney Mutual Aid to an organization in part because we were just running into um, not the same conflicts as in Rockingham, but just people wanted to donate to us. And we were like, please don't donate to us. We are not in us. There's nothing you can donate to. So if we um, are housed in an organization, we can do, we can do more. And I don't, I think, I guess, I think that our assumption is that Putney Mutual Aid, Neighbors Helping Neighbors, may always exist you know if if there's another um, public health emergency if there's a storm emergency we can activate and be one method for distribution there may be ways in which if we created or wanted to participate in a robust um, communication network that might be um, something we could do but the volunteer management piece is is tough people are now what we're seeing is people calling because they need help that has nothing to do with COVID and nothing to do with, you know, it's because they just need help. They need help getting a ride or getting their groceries. And we want to support those neighbors, but we also, um, we're no longer in a state of having a vault, like a, a list of 200 people who've said, I can help, you know, when we call them, well, the majority of them are like, oh, I can't, I'm sorry, I'm back to work. And so, that's, um, I guess, so that's kind of like a statement and also a question because I want, I'm really eager to hear, I've talked a little bit to, to Brattleboro and I think they were at least earlier on this call as well. And they were grappling with some similar issues and their with their own kind of demographic and what, how they had formulated their mutual aid network. But I'm interested in hearing how others are managing that process. Um, 
and we work well with our town and we work out well with our organizations, our, you know, public health or service organizations in town. But um, ultimately that piece, that volunteer management piece is the one that we're finding the most, um, has fizzled the most, but the need hasn't entirely gone away. I'm and, and I see Penelope's got a hand up, but let me ask a follow-up question to you, which is, I know here in central Vermont that Green Mountain United Way actually felt like they had a role to play in some of this volunteer uh, connection work, let's say. And, and mm -hmm. so, but like, honestly, that's more regional and less town specific. And so I don't know, Ruby, like, have you is the United Way in the mix as you think about that? Or is that, does that not feel like a, a good match, I guess? We, we have had connections with uh, United Way and I'm not, I wouldn't say they're robust. And we definitely like, after this last storm, there was, I don't think it was a United Way thing necessarily, but there was 211 organized volunteer, you know, brigade. And on one day, I think it's actually the Saturday, they're coming and helping to fix um, driveways. I literally stumbled on this information. Like I, I stumbled on it. I didn't know what's happening. We, you know, if we directed someone to 211 because that was what we were asked to do, what we were hearing usually is um, a frustration around spinning wheels. And this was one I talked to someone who like called 211, someone showed up, they assessed their driveway and they scheduled uh, you know, we'll have volunteers come. And in my mind, I was like, that's great. Why on earth wouldn't we as a volunteer network in our town be worked into that system? So I definitely feel like there's a way in which the regional and statewide look at the volunteer networks we have is not, we don't, we do not feel tied into those at all. And we also feel completely overlooked by them. And I think there are people in our town who are tied into those, but it's just like, it's stepped over this mutual aid network that exists and has been operating. And I don't have, beyond reconnecting with the United Way people that we were connected with at the beginning, I don't know a method or a, a strategy for making that uh, connection real. Thank you. Uh, Penelope and then Elizabeth. Yeah, hi, uh, Ruby, I was just going to um, respond. I'm in Craftsbury and I actually sat on two neighbor-to-neighbor uh, -neighbor groups, the Hardwick area one, which, which was a lot of neighboring towns. Craftsbury had stood up theirs um, before Hardwick did theirs. So we had another one going and so did Albany. In our situation, one of the things that the pandemic showed us is how many food insecure families we had in our area that we were unaware of. And um, we continued to serve 85 to 90 families per week in Craftsbury itself. And Albany was getting almost that many families. So we ended up um, working with the Hardwick Area Food Pantry to create two permanent satellite food pantries. So that is ongoing. And the person that is coordinating our food pantry is also hanging on to that core volunteer management list because she hears the most through the food pantry situation. So she can add and subtract. And then we have um, persons we, we continue to connect to, as you pointed out, um, you know, when we get an inquiry, when somebody says, you know, could somebody check on Mrs. XYZ down the road, we think she's in trouble, or her daughter-in-law who has to go back to work, who's been helping her, can no longer help her, um, then either Chris or I will contact one of the regional groups, depending on who we discovered during the pandemic would be most appropriate for that. And sometimes it's 211, sometimes it's Northeast Kingdom Human Services, sometimes it's Lamoille County entity. Um, the librarians in Hardwick and Craftsbury are amazing at helping us ferret out other information. But we still, as you say, the challenge is, what is the sustainable ongoing structure? So it's not just Chris and I cobbled together, so to speak. Um, because we clearly, and, and Helen is trying to figure out the same thing in Hardwick right now. So, so we clearly all want to keep this going and, and make sure that 
the information, the knowledge gained during this pandemic can continue to serve the communities. Um, but having some sort of a coalition of all of us where we get together and say, you know what I learned <laughs> last week, we did this and 211 comes out and fixes driveways. I mean, it's it would really be a, a great thing. And that's what, um, John, you were doing for us. Remember when we had the mutual right. aid group yeah. and we missed that. You know, we, we talked that. about it ourselves, you know, <laughs> we, and that, agents, <laughs> we do. And it's so important. I mean, it's just so enlightening in the brief conversations we've had, you know, with yes. Penelope and everybody else that it'd be like, okay. And then there's also maybe VCRD because of who you are to advocate for, you know, in different avenues where you advocate and are visible and influential is you know, a lot of things are getting done because of volunteers on the ground, not just the agencies. The agencies have their things to do, but the core is always the volunteer community liaison. What are we doing to enhance their, you know, uh, connections and development and resources? Thank you, Penelope. Um, I want Elizabeth has had her hand up here and is a new voice to this conversation. And I'm watching the clock. We're going to have to bring this to a close here. Um, Very quickly. Also, go for it. All right. So um, I first of all, this has been fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. And I thank everybody for their energy and <clears throat> everything that's been done. And for a brief moment, without anyone throwing darts at me or anything, I also want to speak to it a little bit from the other side, especially when the day of um, volunteerism came out for driveways and whatnot that were done. All of that was done through um, Vermont organizations active in disaster. And I will speak from um, my own, um, I, I am working on revitalizing the, the COAD, which is would be serving the regional area out of Brattleboro. And um, what I have found over the time is if you don't sort of realign yourself in that structure, um, the expectation from the state down. So, you know, the state gets the 211 information, it goes to this VOAD, and they need to know who's available, and they haven't got any idea. That, so the last time we were lucky enough that um, on that day, we got Mormon missionaries from New Hampshire, actually, to come in and do that work. So it's it's sort of that back and forth. And I would um, tell anyone that is interested in connecting in with that one, because it's one phone call they want to make. And that phone call is going to be to each and every community. It's going to be to the BOAD, who then connects to the individual communities, the way that structure is supposed to work. Um, so um, I would um, say to, uh, I'm happy to put my email up there or just have it go out to the list and we can get you connected to that process. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, and, I remember. And one more thing, we need you. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I have That's to say, it's my other it's, half. <laughs> yeah, it's flattering to hear that. And, you know, we grappled months ago when we stopped doing the reg regular mutual aid convenings. We really grappled with, you know, our attendance had, had dwindled and such. Um, but I take it, I take it seriously, this like this point you were making, which is there is real value, even if it's, you know, 10 of us coming together just to compare notes on a monthly basis. There's real value in sort of that learning that is, is happening. And um, so um, Nick and I will do some consulting as we um, as we think about that. You know, right. I and wanna I'm honor, happy for you to call me if you'd like. Appreciate that, I really do. You know, I wanna honor people's time. We're a little bit over at this point. And um, uh, here's what I would say in closing, which is A, just huge appreciation, not just for our presenters today, but really to all of you. I mean, your participation here is a, pretty solid indicator that you're deep in the work in your own communities and in so many other capacities. And that's what makes our state work is the fact that we have people uh, uh, rolling up their sleeves and doing, doing this work in their local communities in so many capacities. And for us as an organization 
and as this sort of nascent thing, new thing called the Community Leadership Network. Like it's, it's just a privilege, honestly, to be able to be a point of convening for all of you and to listen and to really just be a source of connection. You know, you all uh, hold the wisdom. All we do is just say, okay, show up here and let's start talking and learn, learn from one another. And so just really wanna um, say, we feel really lucky to get to play, play that role at the council meeting. So uh, thanks to you all and let's get out and pick some of those great vegetables and enjoy this gorgeous September day, all right? Thanks, Thanks everybody. Good to see you all.